Engineering is and probably always will be a highly collaborative exercise. And so being able to see uh, a problem from different viewpoints and to really uh, to deeply build that skill of being able to do that is highly valuable in unlocking collaboration in teams. Okay, let's get started. So we'd love to hear, Brendan, what a day in the life of Brendan looks like in terms of um, like, what is, what is your day like today, your week? Like, is it, do you have like meetings all day? Do you still do much uh, like programming and, uh, during the day or is it all just your meetings and stuff? Interested to hear. I do a fair few meetings, um, but I'm careful to defend my time. So, you know, one of the tricks you learn fairly early on uh, is defensive calendaring, where you, you kind of block out your calendar and you protect it so that uh, people can't just invade uh, your calendar and, and, and uh, block out time. So if you create that space uh, to do the deep thinking, that's important. And I use that to do mostly reading. Like I read a lot of documents um, internal. I read a lot of stuff externally, but but mostly internally. Um, just reading and approving proposals. Um, mm. But look, when I'm in meetings, I'm dealing with a whole bunch of um, uh, different aspects of, of running a big company. So a lot of it is context sharing. Uh, mm. I try to maintain a, a very broad view of what the hundreds of teams are doing. It's not necessarily broad because there's so many teams and there's so mm. much activity. But in my travels, in talking to people, I can uh, hopefully spot opportunities for, you know, team, team A to talk to team B because you seem like you're doing something uh, quite related. Um, also sharing context uh, across teams. So... Uh, teams can feel like they're not getting the resources they need to execute on their goals or their, their, their work is not being prioritised or, or they're blocked. Uh, I can provide context around priorities. I can help unblock. Uh, I can... So it's that, that kind of tactical work is quite important. Mm -hmm. But I, I try to focus also on some of the more strategic questions for Canva. Canva's been growing uh, exponentially as a company. And uh, so there's a lot of scale challenges that come with growing an NGORG very, very quickly. We've been doubling our NGORG every year, uh, year on year, uh, for at least seven years. And that means we have to kind of constantly evolve um, the processes and the structures and figure out what what's working, what's not, where are the gaps, um, and try to pragmatically put in place uh, new processes and structures as we evolve and grow. Um, and try to think, you know, try to be future thinking in that, like where, where do we need to be in a year or in five years and try to lay some tracks in those directions. Mm -hmm. um, I spend a fair bit of time too with escalations, so things that, that just, um, for, there's competing opposing views on, on whatever proposal and it'll come to me and I'll, I'll make a final call. Uh, I deal with a lot of approvals, so salary approvals, equity approvals, hiring plans, spending on tooling, and I spend a fair bit of time doing recruitment. So when we're trying to recruit top talent, uh, I will be involved uh, to try and um, sell sell uh, high profile candidates on uh, the joys of working at Canva, the mm -hmm. challenges that, that are before us. Uh, another thing that takes a lot of my time is uh, performance management, like thinking about uh, our career framework, adapting our career framework, interpreting our career framework so that our managers uh, understand how to set expectations. Uh, we have a system of promotions, so or we don't call them promotions, we call them role changes at Canva. So we run a process that um, at a regular cycle, we accept applications to, to be promoted and we look at evidence uh, of an individual's uh, output 
uh, at see if it measures up for, for that promotion. And we put a lot of effort into that to make sure that we calibrate across the organization so we're fair. Uh, that's, that's a lot of work. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And when you think about like designing some of these things, like whether it's the sort of um, the structure around promotions and like you mentioned that the engineering size is growing quite rapidly. Where do you look to, or how, how does, how do you sort of think about creating those things? Like, cause there, do you kind of borrow from other organizations that are in a similar situation or is it kind of like, let's just think about this from first principles and try and design our own, like, or maybe it's a bit of both. It sounds like it's a kind of a tough thing, right? When things are growing that quickly. Yeah, look, it's, it's a little from column A, a little from column B. We certainly go and look at prior art. Um, we study companies that are ahead of us on the growth curve. Um, we try to look at those companies kind of soberly um, and uh, we use some as cautionary tales and others as kind of exemplars that we might want to replicate. We always want to put our spin on processes and structures though, to make them our own. So we, we invest a fair amount of effort into kind of understanding what's worked for other companies uh, and then distilling it into language that is familiar to, to Canva and feels very kind of Canva-esque. Mm. Yeah, nice. Um, I have a question too around like your role at the moment, you're obviously looking after lots of different engineering teams across the organization, but is that something that you always wanted to do? Like, did you always see yourself as someone that was like, leading like lots of engineers or has it like perhaps been something more recently that you're kind of like oh this could be cool like let's give it a go it certainly wasn't a career ambition at all i uh i've always enjoyed individual contribution and engineering management but mostly individual contribution and across my career uh, i've mostly just been an engineer uh, and, and building things i have had stints at being a manager in other organizations I think that the difference with Canva is I joined very early. So the level of commitment I have to, to Canva is probably uh, higher than, than at any time in my career. And, uh, you know, I've always had this philosophy of just doing whatever. And I think a, a, lot, of the, a lot of the early employees had this uh, very early on of just doing whatever is needed. And so um, as we grew, you know, it became more and more apparent that we need engineering management uh, as well as individual contribution. And I kind of found myself kind of stepping more and more into that role at Canva. But I enjoy it. Um, I think the challenges are, and the challenges and the rewards are very different, but the rewards are still there and they're still quite intellectual. It's not, yeah. it's not, um, it's not coding. I do get to do that occasionally, but very, very rarely. And it's always a bit sobering when you, when you try, try, and, <laughs> try and get back on the tools and realize yeah. oh, it's been a while. How does, how does, how does Git work again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. No, that's cool. That's interesting to hear that. Cause I think, um, yeah, many people that are like senior and perhaps like even more senior than like the most senior people, right. Have this clear thing without like from an early stage are like i'm gonna pursue this 100 percent uh and then that's kind of their vision and then it's just a long time until they end up getting that um so that's interesting i think it's interesting to hear different ways people approach that sure excellent well what about um let's talk about like management and stuff there you mentioned um how do you actually when we talk about like an engineering team and the performance of those teams I'm interested to hear how you think about the like measuring that performance because it's some it's it's something that's perhaps hard to do like you could there's kind of maybe bad metrics like lines of code or something like that where it's not really reflective of <laughs> the actual work that's being done like how does how does that process work um for yourself do you have any ways you think about uh, tackling that yeah, it is a, it's a really tricky thing in engineering. The ultimate measure is our teams delivering on their goals. Are they setting good goals and are they able to break those goals down into milestones and then are they able to deliver on those milestones uh, in, a, in a timely fashion? So we, we really try to look at the output of teams and individuals. Um, we don't want that, that output to come at a personal cost, though, for those teams. So we, we, 
we kind of talk about sustainable urgency. We want teams to go fast, but only as fast as uh, they can while maintaining health, healthy work-life balance and you know a sustainable work culture for the long term. You gave that example of measuring uh, various development metrics, and that is a really um, dangerous road to go down. Um, we, we talk about Goodhart's law at, at Canva quite a bit. Uh, we are striving to be a data-driven company, but in, in being a data-driven company, we want to always be mindful of Goodhart's law, which is basically saying that as soon as you start measuring something by a particular metric, that metric tends to, tends to lose its value as a good way of measuring anything. Mm. It's also really important to remember that if you are totally focused on metrics, then there's a risk of focusing on things that you can easily measure. And there's a whole lot of really important things that are not easy to measure. Uh, so we just have to keep that in mind when we're, when we're kind of constructing uh, success measures for teams. Mm -hmm. And ultimately it's about delivery and that sustainable delivery. So we look for that track record of delivery at individuals and teams, and we look for the health and well-being of the team to make sure that the team is is happy in in delivering mm. um, yeah that's it's look we could talk for yeah. hours <laughs> yeah you know, your example of measuring commits i've literally seen um i've seen i've seen teams that are that, you know there's a leaderboard of you know the, the top committers and it and it, it drives perverse behaviors you know people figure out how to create commits or how to break their changes into smaller commits so they write up the leaderboard and, you know, we, so we really got to be careful. Uh, it also sends a message when you, when you focused on those um, uh, code oriented metrics, whatever they are, that all of the other activities that are essential in running a team aren't as important. You know, we've got for engineering managers, there's a lot of work that goes into expectation management of the team, running the cadences of the team, uh, discussing and reviewing technical approaches and all of that's much harder to measure. So if you're focused on these hard kind of code-oriented metrics, you can actually send the message that this other vital work isn't as important, and mm. that's that's very dangerous. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's an interesting take there. I liked the, um, you know, the urgency, consistent urgency, I think, um, or you, <laughs> something like that. But I think that's a great way of doing it, right? Um, yeah, sustainable. Sustainable, that's right. Gotcha. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> no, very good. Um, what do you think, like a lot of, lot of talk there about like engineering managers and, and things. What do you think are some traits that make effective managers in your experience? Mm -hmm. Look, our best frontline managers uh, tend to be those who have some recent lived experience on the tools. In other words, they've been individual contributors in the recent past and they've kind of stepped into engineering management. I think that gives them... Uh, a high degree of empathy with the engineers that they are managing. We do expect our engineering managers to be technical contributors. Um, usually that's through technical direction, through reviewing and vetting technical designs. Sometimes it's through direct technical contribution, but engineering managers uh, are going to be time poor, so that that's, um, I guess, the exception, not the norm. Mm. Um, it actually cuts both ways too. That it, you know, it's great for even if you're on the build or what we call the build track, uh, the individual contribution track in your career. It's quite useful, I think, to spend some time being an engineering manager and understand. It's very easy when you're an individual contributor to have your headphones on and to think of the manager, you know, the pointy-headed boss, um, somewhat dismissively. But when you when you step into that pilot seat, uh, you get a real appreciation for the pressures they're under, uh, for the challenges that they face, which are quite intellectual challenges often, and that rounds you out as an individual contributor. You might end up back on the individual contribution track, and at Canva, we allow you to kind of pendulum back and forth uh, quite deliberately, uh, but it gives you that that appreciation. Mm. So so you, you mentioned, I, I kind of went off on a philosophical tangent there, but you mentioned like what are the skills we look for? Um, Certainly, it's that technical prowess. Like we want to see um, people who have technical competency in, in engineering management, but we we want to see some other um, organisational skills. So the ability to 
understand a, a bigger goal, be able to break it down into milestones and tasks, and then guide a team and you know basically lead a team through the execution of those milestones and tasks. And that's that can be quite a challenging uh, skill to learn. It is a skill though, and you can learn it. Um, and then finally, uh, I guess engineering managers need to be able to set clear expectations. They need to be able to communicate explicitly to, to teams what is expected of them, and then be able to hold those teams and individuals accountable to those expectations, which again is, that's a skill that you can learn. It's not, um, it's something that I think a lot of engineers struggle with because uh, uh, they're not, it, it can be, it can, it can feel like a quite a frank and uncomfortable conversation, but um, it's actually a skill that you can learn. Mm. How, like, is that something that you had to learn? And, and like, how did you go about, like, if so, how did you go oh, about that? Absolutely. I, I think that, um, uh, you know, a mistake that, um, that first time engineering managers make uh, is, and, and, and it often gets touted as a kind of a, uh, a leadership principle of kind of leading by example, but leading by example has real limitations. Um, you know, do as I do uh, only works to some extent, uh, and it can actually be an anti-pattern for an engineering manager, particularly one who's kind of transitioned from individual contribution to engineering management, where they end up just doing a lot of work, mm -hmm. and it's not really uh, clear to uh, the team that, that there's an example being set. So you've got to kind of step outside of that a little bit. And um, instead of kind of implicitly setting expectations by working really hard and expecting other people to follow, um, you've really got to be explicit to say, okay, let's talk about the expectations of the role. You, you have this set of tasks. Um, I'm here to help. Uh, and and really laying out what your expectations are quite explicitly. And that gives actually your direct reports a lot of psychological safety. If they understand what's expected of them, then that's half the battle in them uh, meeting the, the performance mm. requirements of the job. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I think the, the psychological safety and building that into teams is, is obviously like quite a, an important thing to have. Um, make sure that people are sort of comfortable and able to think and say things that they are thinking, <laughs> you know, and you know, being being comfortable and able to say them. Very important. Um, perhaps we can switch from like management now to like an individual contributor or, or an engineer. Um, there's this phrase of a 10x engineer, uh, someone that is able to do more and contribute like 10 times more than sort of a standard engineer. I wonder if you've seen people like that, and if so, what kind of things that they tend to do better than um, perhaps a not not a ten x <laughs> engineer? Yeah, look, it's that phrase is. Um, I think it got its origin from some research. I, I don't quote me, but I, I think it was an IBM uh, research project from the maybe even from the from the nineteen eighties. Look, it's undoubtedly true that there are individuals, you know, there's a wide degree of, of output in, in, in individuals, in teams. And you do see uh, the, the odd engineer who is capable of, you know, an order of magnitude more output than a, than a competent engineer. Um, it's actually a really, really difficult thing to manage on a team though. Uh, it can set up all sorts of really unhealthy dynamics if that individual is screaming ahead of the team. Uh, it, it, it destabilizes the team because if it's not managed well, because that individual, they're so far ahead of the team, they tend to be uh, producing a lot of work that the, the rest of the team has to comprehend to be able to, to build on top of or to work mm. with. Uh, and so that, that creates this kind of review burden for the rest of the team. Uh, that they have to, they're constantly playing catch up to the sheer quantity of work that this individual is producing. And um, as a consequent, work, work tends to back up behind these individuals um, because they're the only people who know how the system works, they built most of it. And uh, that's, that's really 
can can lead to some quite toxic situations. Mm. So uh, we actually think that's a bit of a pathology at Canberra, and we we do recognise these high output individuals, but what we value in, in in, in that high output is someone who can uplift people around them. It's, so it's not the, they're still individual contributors, but they take teams or groups of people along for the journey. So they're not only uh, brilliant um, individual contributors, but they're also excellent at mentoring, at educating, at directing others, at quickly unblocking teams. And these, these people are worth their weight in gold. Mm. Uh, they're the people who bring their their teams along. They lift everyone around them uh, to to a higher level of execution through that technical communication, through technical teaching, and they're the ones that we really try to select for and and try to um, reward at Canva, rather than that first category of the kind of like the, the person with the headphones on that's just out it, that's just smashing code out. Mm. Because uh, that's that's quite a dangerous. Um, it's a very hard thing for a team to manage mm. in the long term. Yeah, wow, that's a pretty good answer. I think, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it's a great point. I definitely can see that happening. Um, but it's it's. I agree. It's that's the sort of person that you want in the team is someone that's gonna like bring the team up with them rather than just like almost bring the team down. Probably if they're just going going um, one direction by themselves. Mm. Yeah, now our, our career track, you know, we have an individual contribution career track and it's very much, uh, it's very explicit in that, that as you rise in that track, the expectation is that you are spending more and more time sharing your knowledge and being a multiplier. So being a force multiplier rather than being the individual who is just smashing mm. out the, the code. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, you were an, an individual contributor for a while, like you mentioned. How does, like, uh, I have a question about sort of upskilling and, and education because I think there's a lot of education now around, like, going from someone that doesn't know any code to, like, knows a, a little bit or knows some. But then once you kind of get to the, the point where you're a senior engineer perhaps, then the sort of learning, it's, it's not like you can just take a course and really and then become... <laughs> like you know someone that's really specialized and really good so i wonder for yourself how do you, how have you thought about sort of upskilling and and if you are going down the individual contributor track like getting to the going from sort of senior to then like really sort of almost pushing the field forward perhaps in some ways um like mm -hmm. yeah how do you think about that there's i yeah, look, it's, it, it depends on your individual learning style. For me, I learn through through doing. Like it's, I can read a textbook, um, but um, uh, it stays fairly theoretical for me until I'm kind of, you know, got my hands dirty with the, with the technology. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like to be, I like to be hands on in learning. Other people can uh, absorb a lot uh, directly from theory and then apply it. Um, there's no shortcuts here in getting to that uh, those upper echelons. You know, becoming an you know the ultimate is you know some kind of industry expert. You've really just got to put the hours and hours and hours of, of practice in, and you know it helps to to really enjoy what you're doing to get um, a lot of energy out of doing it. Um, I think it's a it's also good in an individual contribution career to mix up the problem spaces to, because, you know, we have engineers who interview with us that, you know, that they've got senior engineer in their title. They've been, uh, you know, that maybe they have, you know, five, seven years experience, but when you get them into an interview setting, what you discover is they've been solving the same problem over and over again for a long time. Uh, and so they haven't been able to broaden their, their technical thinking. They haven't been able to break. Um, they haven't been able to uh, build real depth because they haven't been challenged. They've been in a, in a kind of a comfort zone, solving that same same kind of problem domain over and over again. So, varying the problem domains, um, uh, finding finding the ways to go deep. Um, I think that they're the keys, mm. and and just spending the hours doing it. So you, you kind of want to 
what you, you hope that you you love what yeah. you're doing. <laughs> you know, need to spend those hours and hours and hours just just doing the work to to, to build the yeah. expertise. Yeah, no, no, of course. I think that's a great point, um, and an interesting one as well. Because yeah, I think uh, like I think at the top of every field, nearly like it's you'd be surprised if someone's there and and doesn't really <laughs> really love what they do. I think uh, like mm. to sort of get to that stage, you kind of need that's almost a prerequisite. I think. Um, I'd love to sort of specialize our chat around engineering it down into sort of the junior level um, and junior mm-hmm. engineers. Um, I wonder what, um, say there's a bunch of new engineers joining Canada, they're all juniors. What are some mistakes that you've seen junior engineers make? Uh, into Like perhaps they join the company and they're like super keen to like go and do a whole bunch of stuff, learn heaps, um, but perhaps they make a couple of mistakes and then perhaps they don't really get as far as they otherwise should have. I wonder if there's any mistakes that you've seen junior engineers make. Hmm. Um, look, I think the the biggest mistake I see is uh, uh, people forgetting um, the, the – the, people not taking a first principles approach to to learning and a little bit being a little bit too technology focused. So they come in, they, they've learned maybe on the side, they've learned some some cool tools or technologies. They want to apply them, and uh, there's a bit of a kind of a shiny bauble effect of kind of like, oh, I learn React, and um, and I, I really want to build build stuff in React, uh, or I've learned some other shiny tool, technique, process, whatever it is. Um, one of the one of the things we really drum into our, our grad engineers is taking the time to build context, like deeply understand the context of the systems that you're building on top of, try to break that understanding down into first principles and then be able to reason about uh, whatever proposal you have from first principles uh, and then test that idea carefully um, First, first yourself. You know, do some second order thinking around what your the the solution that you're proposing, uh, rather than just kind of uh, having that blinkered vision of like I have I I know tool X and therefore I will apply mm-hmm. it to problem domain. Um, taking the time to really break the problem down to understand the context of the system uh, to build that domain knowledge uh, and then being really kind of hyper-rational about well, what's the best solution uh, that puts you in good stead. That's a, that's a hard skill to learn though because people just want to code, right? They want to just mm. build stuff. Uh, but it's a bit of an anti-pattern in engineering or to kind of uh, to be in that kind of mode of unconstrained ideation where you just kind of like, oh, what if we did this and what if we did that? And my answer is always, well, you tell me what what if mm-hmm. we did that. Like you'd spend the time to figure it out. Don't be burdening the senior engineers around you in answering those questions mm-hmm. for you. You've got the, the ability to reason about this yourself. And if you can demonstrate building the understanding of the and the context of the system that you're working with and to answer those questions, uh, then that's really valuable for for your team that you're able to do that discipline mm. thinking. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Yeah, the other thing I'd add is that you know it's a little bit more of the same, but the shiny bauble syndrome is very mm. real. In that uh, you know, every every few years, along comes some particular technology which is presented either by industry thought leaders or by vendors masquerading as industry thought leaders as as the the, the silver bullet um and you know it's it's really easy for grads to be um to become enamored uh with that to, to kind of almost worship at the altar of the technology rather than kind of taking a bit more of a clear-eyed view of like well how does this technology what's the value of this technology how does it compare to its um to, to its uh, to, to prior art and how is it a, how is it actually directly applicable to the problem domain I have you know the one that's thankfully it seems to be losing its luster a little bit but blockchain is something we hear mm. a lot about at the moment but if you if you really think hard about blockchain it's it's kind of hard to find 
practical applications for the technology. It's a very cool tech. Mm. It's very it's very exciting when you think about it. It's a great intellectual exercise to think about it, but its practical applications are, are somewhat mm. limited. Yeah, uh, I agree. I think it's it, it, it probably in the last, maybe even this year or or perhaps longer, I think it's definitely lost a little, little bit of the shine that it perhaps had maybe four, three or four years ago. Um, <laughs> like, like, I mean, you know, like it's not just, I'm not singling mm-hmm. out blockchain because before it there were, you know, there were other trends in technology that, um, you know, it used to be NoSQL and, and, and people rushed into NoSQL without really understanding the, the trade-offs uh, that need to be taken. Before that, it was XML. XML was going to solve everything. And, um, you know, I remember the group think that is a, that, that can emerge around these uh, shiny, fashionable technologies is very, very dangerous, and, but very mm. hard to resist it. Yeah, times. definitely. Well, how do you think about, like, when a new tool like like something like blockchain or NoSQL or whatever comes along, is there a way that you think about differentiating what is like a new shiny thing versus something that is actually a genuine breakthrough and, like, perhaps we should consider adopting this because, like, it's, it is actually quite cool like is there any way to think about those yeah look it's it's a tough that's a really tough one because obviously um in amongst all of the the new shiny frothy ideas there's some really good ones that that um you know three years down the track if you had hindsight you would have adopted early so how do you pick those winners well look we try to create space for engineers to tinker and to play with new technologies um that's there's a there's a balancing act there because we can't have them in production. So we, we have, you know, I'm a big fan of the um, the boring technology club. Mm. You know, mature technologies uh, they have warts, but those warts are well understood. We understand the performance profiles and the deficiencies of those technologies, and we can engineer around them. Um, bleeding edge tech, you know, it's called bleeding edge for a reason. You bleed when you, when you adopt it. So what we tend to do, we have a fairly high bar for, for technology adoption at Canva. Um, we want to see uh, a clear-eyed rationale for why a particular technology is a net benefit to us. We also want to try always to not uh, unnecessarily expand the surface area of technologies that we're using. We try to keep the set of technologies we're using relatively small. Uh, that aids in mobility of engineers within the organization because there's not a huge diversity in technology that's used across the org. It helps even in the day-to-day uh, engineering uh, comprehension. You know, the cognitive cost to engineers is lower if you have a, a, a smaller set of technologies you're using uh, and you have familiar patterns that are being used across uh, to to solve problems in a similar mm. way, you know, engineers can encounter uh, different components in the in the system and recognize and quickly understand how they work because they're in a familiar technology using familiar patterns. Um, so, in ser- in service of that kind of keeping the set of technologies small, if you've got some new uh, technology that you think will uplift us. We certainly want to hear about it, uh, but the burden of proof mm-hmm. is high. So we want to understand uh, what is the total cost of adoption. And in saying that, we, we really want to try and aim for a step change where we're, we're not kind of forking our technology solution. We don't end up with an old way and a new way. We end up with just one way. And that one way may be the new way, um, but we want to see that total cost of adoption be factored in uh, because, you know, if you fork and you end up with two ways of solving a particular problem, then in a year's time, there may be a yet another new way and then you fork again and now you've got four mm. ways or three, you know, you, you keep expanding and then the, you end up with this explosion of uh, complexity as you, you've got this combinatorial explosion of different technologies and, and solutions and that's that's very dangerous that's a very dangerous it's a that's an emergent complexity that becomes very very difficult to manage and is a real impediment to uh, maintaining an evolving and building on top of the systems that that, uh, mm. that you're building yeah that's really interesting that's really interesting to hear that 
Um, I, I like that point about like keeping the set of tech that you use uh, to a minimum, and then that, that means like engineers can kind of move around more easily. I think that's a great point. Um, but what do you th- what do you think about um, like specialization and like generalization? Um, is it like what would you say to someone perhaps that is like m- m- like starting their career or even is I guess at any stage? Um, is there like a preference that you'd have for either of those in terms of learning a whole bunch of things? Perhaps it's like some new and then old stuff or specializing into certain things. Um, like, it, it, like, and perhaps like mm. when would you consider doing either of those if there, if there was a difference there? Yeah, we look, we like our engineers to specialize. Um, but in saying that we, subscribe to you probably have heard the term a a t-shaped engineer so we like engineers to have a specialty where they where they spend you know potentially years honing craft and building deep knowledge in a particular specialty but while they're doing that we want them to be uh, aware and building knowledge of adjacent um, uh, technologies uh, adjacent skill sets uh, and then hopefully building some depth in those. So that's that's where the T shape comes in. You kind of broad, you, get, you build out this broad knowledge base, but then you go deep on one mm-hmm. or two uh, specialties. Um, in a career that's you know might span thirty years, you can probably expect to go deep on on several. Um, but it, to, to the the point I made previously, going deep. Um, usually requires a lot of execution, like a lot of a lot of time, and so you know you've got to you've got to choose carefully on what you mm-hmm. go deep on. And again, to my point, you know the shiny shiny stuff. Uh, sometimes it's it's not the the shiny shiny fashionable technology uh, that I would choose. You try and try and pick uh, something that's a little bit more stable, has the evidence of execution and, and success around it. Um, you know, I'd be very worried uh, as an engineer, um, you know, doing a, doing a degree in blockchain. That would, that mm. would scare me right now. Yeah. Because um, I'm not sure that that's going to be particularly, yeah. particularly applicable. Yeah, um, definitely. I feel like, yeah, with the specialization, like you said, you've got to be perhaps a little bit careful that you don't specialize in a, in a trend rather than something that's going to be around for the long term. Yeah, so you, you've got to try and pick the more fundamental technologies. Um, and, you, you know, you've got to be looking at where the industry is going and, you know, look at companies like, like, like Canva, like Google, like Facebook, and see what technology stacks they're building on. Uh, and, you know, that's, they're, they're probably a pretty good sign that those technology stacks are, mm-hmm. are in it for the long haul. And you know, some of those technology stacks are going to be pretty boring. Like we, we love Java coders. You know, Java is not exactly a fashionable language these days, but most of our backends are built in Java. And uh, so I still think it's a good language mm. to get a grounding in. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's, that's pretty cool. I, I think that's it's an interesting um, thing to think about, definitely. Appreciate your insights there. Um, what... What do you when you're looking to sort of bring engineers into the organization? Um, what what are or perhaps amongst engineers generally when they go and that they do well at Canva, let's say, um, what do you think are some traits that are undervalued by the marketplace or things that you think um, you personally value but are undervalued or like the market kind of doesn't appreciate as much as you think they should? Well, we mentioned critical thinking before. I, I do think that's an undervalued skill. Uh, you know, we see a lot of grads coming in very technological, uh, ver- a very technological focus. They're very excited about their technical skills and the knowledge that they have. But I want to see critical thinking applied. Uh, you know, real engineering is is problem solving. So if you get good at problem solving, if you develop your critical thinking techniques. Uh, you know, if you if you develop your skills in how to reason about problems from first principles, uh, how to do higher order thinking, understanding logical fallacies, etc., I think they're they're great skills to have, and they're pretty pretty undervalued. Um, another another one I'd list is is more on the 
what what is traditionally thought of as soft skills, which is you know empathy in engineering, is a, is a really important and underrated skill, and it's a when you mention the word empathy, people often think of kind of like a warm, fuzzy, emotional, uh, uh, mm. innate trait. But, but really, it, it's it's not that at all. It's actually a skill that you can hone, and it, it's just a skill of seeing uh, seeing the world from from other others' perspectives and deeply understanding other people's perspectives. And you know, engineering is and probably always will be a highly collaborative exercise. And so being able to see uh, a problem from different viewpoints and to really uh, to deeply build that skill of being able to do that is highly valuable in unlocking collaboration in teams. And there's, you know, there's really practical things that you can practice to, to achieve that. One of the great... Um, uh, techniques that that I try and champion in in young engineers is the unfortunately named uh, steel manning technique, which I, I'm mm. not sure if you've you've heard of, but it you know it's the opposite of straw manning. Straw manning would be where you replace you see in a technical discussion or any discussion um, you see the discussion as an argument to be won. You interpret someone else's argument. Uh, in an in inferior form, and then you shoot that inferior form down. That's straw manning. But steel manning is doing the exact opposite, where you see any technical discussion for what it is, people bringing diverse perspectives and viewpoints into that kind of collaborative problem-solving space, and you're able to take a step back from your own position, really deeply understand someone else's position, uh, and then understand it to the point where you can argue it for them. And what you find when you can do that, uh, one of two things, can, well, one of many things can happen, but what, what can often happen is by really stepping into someone else's shoes, arguing their point for them, and you have to do that genuinely, you can actually change your mind. You can change your position. You can, you can uh, convince yourself of their position, and that can be a really powerful way um, of unblocking teams where there are competing views of how to solve a particular problem. Uh, you can also, you know, uh, even if you think you're still right, you can be, by demonstrating that empathy with, uh, with people who disagree with you, that's a very disarming way to collaborate. That disarms your, the, the people who uh, you're collaborating with and it creates that constructive environment mm. where you can move forward. Yeah, that's cool. I like that a lot. Uh, yeah, I think that's super important. It's a, it's a much it's it's much nicer to deal with someone that is like can see the way that you're thinking about it and like is is coming at it in a constructive way uh, versus someone that's looking to sort of shoot the way shoot down the way that you're looking at solving it. Um, definitely, I think that's mm -hmm. that's super cool. Um, I like that a lot. Um, for yourself, I want to sort of ask a couple of questions more generally about yourself and, and your career. Um, so when when you were, uh, you'd worked a few software jobs and you um, founded, co-founded the startup Senqua, uh, and you had a couple yep. of guys there that you sort of co-founded that with. Um, how, like, how formative was that experience um, for yourself and in terms of, like, creating a, a, a product, um, you know, going out and doing things and uh, without the sort of, you know, almost like joining a startup in, in some sense. Um, like, yeah, how formative was that experience for yourself and your engineering journey? Uh, very formative. Um, it, you know, having your own company, uh, it, it, it definitely removes the safety net. You know, there's no there's no one to do the thing but you. You know, there's a company with four of us. Uh, there's there's lots of work to be done, and it's not all coding. Um, so you get an appreciation for for many aspects of running a business, not just not just the engineering. Uh, and the the level of personal commitment is huge, right? You just have to commit. Uh, if you don't put the work in, if you don't do the work, no one else is going to do it. And so you've got to be very committed. We were very, very driven. Uh, we called ourselves a lifestyle company um, in that we kind of told ourselves that we could, 
you know, we could take time off and we can go at a leisurely pace. But of course, that, that doesn't really happen. You tend to, to live and breathe uh, the company. Uh, and it's, it, you, I guess that's a trap as well. You've got to be careful. But it, no, very, very formative uh, experience, very eye opening uh, in understanding all aspects of, of software delivery, you know, not mm. just the. <laughs> writing writing code. yeah is there like what, what parts of that journey would you say have been most beneficial and perhaps most relevant into what you do today is there anything that you still uh, like anything that still has been a really uh, really like useful <laughs> or a useful experience perhaps to go through um in in that startup situation um I, it's, it's, I think it's, it was useful in understanding what it means to be an owner, like what it means, like you've really got skin in the game. So if you, if you, it gives you agency and you, it understands, you, you understand what it means to have agency and to create agency. And it's one of the things that in any organization is a struggle, you know, the bystander effect that you kind of think when well, you come in, you're doing the thing. Uh, if you don't do it right, someone else has got it. Or if there's a decision to be made, you put it off because someone else will make the decision. And um, when you own your own company and there's no safety net, it gives you that agency and that focus that you, you, you've got this. And if you don't have this, then no one else does. And I think if you can carry that forward into particularly smaller companies, but you know even larger ones, that sense of agency is really important. You know the 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 ability to kind of grab hold of something and own it entirely. And that's not necessarily a system or a component, it could be a process, could be decision-making around uh, a structure or whatever. Uh, if you can show that you can grab hold of something and then drive it to completion uh, with that agency, then that's mm. really, really powerful. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. It's the uh, extreme ownership, perhaps, uh, response, taking responsibility those kinds of things i think that's a, a good trait like um no matter where you are in the organization too whether you are someone that's more senior and does kind of have the responsibility by default or if you even if you are more junior and taking responsibility of your little piece of the puzzle i think i think that's a, a good great mindset to have definitely um Perhaps thinking about yourself um, as well, if we think about folks that are perhaps early in their career and want and, and have look at someone like yourself and say, man, I really want to be the CTO or I want to be the head of engineering. Um, is there anything that you would say that they, like any advice, perhaps common advice that you think they should ignore when it comes to uh, careers and things that are commonly commonly told to, to people at that stage? Well, I mean, I, I think that, uh, you know, for me, I'll talk about personally what's been my career mm. philosophy. Uh, I've always tried to work at companies with technology at their at their centre. Um, and that, that's been important for me. Uh, I've also always tried to stay as technical as possible for as long as possible, uh, just to build that that deep technical expertise. I didn't have a career destination in mind. Um, I don't fault those people that do, but for me, it was just kind of like just doing what I enjoyed. Uh, and, you know, as I said, I've been quite lucky in, in where I've ended up. Um, but, you know, the, the side effect of staying technical for a long time is that you do see, you get exposed to a wide variety of team cultures, a wide variety of problem domains, and a wide variety of solutions. And so that that technical depth uh, gives you a good grounding to go into engineering management at some point if you if you so choose. We do have, uh, and I have great friends who, you know, are 25, 30 years as, as technical contributors, as individual contributors, and that's a, a valid career mm. path as well. Um, but yeah, look, that's that's worked for me. Uh, survivor bias. Uh, no, uh, I've had a lot of luck. Nice. Well, I'd love to perhaps talk about a time uh, 
if there are any, then you were maybe slightly more unlucky. And, and my question is, has there been a time in your career that you failed at something or something didn't go to plan, uh, but at, at the time it felt like it was sort of going wrong, but it later turned out to work out well and perhaps later on it was something that was, yeah, it worked out well. Is there anything there that, that comes to mind? Look, I, I graduated from uni in 1997 and the, the first tech bubble was just forming. And, you know, I did a an honours thesis in distributed uh, web indexing um, before Google existed. And I still have regrets to this day uh, um, not kind of... Uh, Grab, grabbing that opportunity in, in 97 when I graduated and kind of going and, and maybe taking a punt and moving to the Valley and, and joining, uh, joining in on, on some of that action uh, as, the, as the dot-com bubble uh, formed. You know, there's a, obviously a lot of horror stories with companies that crashed and burned, but then there were also companies like Google that emerged at that time and are now household names. And if I was, you know, looking back, I would have, I would have pushed myself a little bit more to kind of step outside my comfort zone. And, you know, I built up some, some pretty, at the time, probably reasonably unique knowledge in thinking about how you index the web and, in a distributed way. And, and uh, that was all very novel and, and pretty mm. hot, um, hot topic. And, uh, and I just went into a, a much more safe uh uh, safe engineering job at a telecommunications company, and maybe I, I should have uh, pushed myself a bit harder to to, to go and uh, you know try my luck at, at Silicon Valley. No, don't have too many regrets mm. in that regard, obviously, because it's kind of things have worked out. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Well, that's definitely something that perhaps didn't go uh, so well at the time, but has ended up working out quite well. <laughs> I would say, amazing. Um, I wonder, like. When it comes to sort of engineering and, and your career as well, what has been uh, something that you um, like has been your most worthwhile investment? Uh, whether it's an investment of time, like maybe it's a course you did or something that you participated in, or um, or whether it's something you, that you invested with money, or like maybe it's a something that you purchased or a thing that you attended that you paid for. Um, is there anything there that you think has, was was perhaps like really crucial in, in getting you to where you are today? Uh, so look, I've always enjoyed building software on the side. So I I've invested in in doing that for myself, just just to it, and it, and I haven't approached it as a chore. It's just a passion. Um, I, I don't think I could do it if I if I felt like it was a a chore to brown to to, to broaden my my skill set. But um, I've just enjoyed tinkering, tinkering with with software and and hardware, um, and I think that's been enormously valuable. You know, the company Senqua um, got its first income from a side project that I was just working on, uh, that we then turned into a commercial product. Um, so that's that worked really, really well for me. And I and I I also really. And maybe I, I go overboard on this, but I really try to focus on having the discipline to see those projects through to completion. It's very easy to kind of start side projects, but it's much harder to see them through to some logical uh, conclusion. And in saying that, you know, I, I fail more often than not. You know, I've got I've got hundreds of, of projects that you mm. know, have progressed very little, uh, but but it's still something that I really try to do. Um, in saying that, I don't want to. You know, there's a. I want to acknowledge that not everyone has that opportunity um, uh, for, for whatever reason. Their own personal circumstances means it's difficult. So I don't want to set that up as a kind of a prerequisite. Um, you know, certainly, you know, grads or, or engineers that come to us, uh, they have all sorts of different life experiences, and we don't expect to see that kind of tinkering or, or, or side projects or you know, open mm. source contribution. Uh, it's great when we do, but it's certainly not a prerequisite. Yeah, that's cool. I think, uh, yeah, it's interesting, like the side projects. I think there's many a story of those, uh, someone working on something on the side that ends up becoming something quite cool. So um, that's really exciting. 
Um, I've got one more question for you, Brendan. Uh, and that's a question I ask all the guests that come on the mm-hmm. show. And that is um, advice for young people that have just graduated university, perhaps young engineers uh, in this case. Like, What advice would you give someone that's fresh out of university and wants to become a, a great engineer? Uh, wow. Okay. Well, look, I, th- I think it's, uh, it's definitely the case that you want to find, um, uh, mature engineering orgs to join where you can learn from exceptional individuals. So you, you want to find the, the engineering cultures, uh, in, in the mature engineering teams, uh, where you've got these, um, uh, mentors, uh, informal or otherwise, that can teach you uh, the art of, of software engineering, and you, you can you can learn from. So, and you know, we certainly deliberately set out to create a culture mm-hmm. like that at Canva. Um, but you know, like the, a lot of the big companies, like Google, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, Apple, they will all have that. And I think that's you know that's something to definitely aim for. I think that there is a, a risk for grads in um, and I'm not saying it's don't do it, but I think there's just some risks in in maybe joining smaller outfits where uh, you can very quickly be uh, the most knowledgeable and experienced person in the room, and and that can be dangerous if you if you're just fresh out of uni. You know, so it can work. Mm. You know, it's just a risk. Um, I, I <clears throat> personally think that it's better to join somewhere where you've got those mentors uh, that, that help you see what great looks like. And can help you get there. Yeah, join a, a company like Canva. <laughs> I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> amazing. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, uh, thanks You're so much for that. coming on the show today, Brendan. I wonder if, if people are listening and they want to find out more about yourself or perhaps connect with you. Is there any um, place that they should go and find out more? Uh, I am on Twitter. I tweet very, very infrequently, um, but if people wanted to find me, I'm Brendan H, B-R-E-N-D-A-N-H on Twitter. I'm also on LinkedIn, uh, although I get a lot of LinkedIn requests, so I may not be, um, uh, I may not reply, but uh, but that, that'd be the Fantastic. Two well, yeah, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Appreciate you having me along. No worries, James. I've enjoyed the chat. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you want to get my takeaways, the things that I learned from this episode, please go to graduatetheory.com slash subscribe where you can get my takeaways and all the information about each episode straight to your inbox. Thanks so much for listening again today and we're looking forward to seeing you next week.